Grace and peace to you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Welcome to worship at Bethlehem. We're glad to have you this morning. We are the church together and we are the church apart. And whether you are joined with us here in the sanctuary this morning or worshiping from home on the live stream, we're glad that you're part of our church family. We have a few items for community time. Uh, first of all, the clipboards with activities and the crayons and the little flip cards for the children's chat are all back in the narthex. So during um, our opening singing, if you want to duck back there and grab one for your kiddos, you're welcome to do that. Uh, speaking of singing, we're going to do a lot of singing today. I know that that is something we have missed over the last year, and uh, now that we are uh, able to do that again, we're going to have several opportunities for hymn requests uh, throughout the service. So grab those hymnals and be looking up those hymn numbers and uh, we hope we can accommodate as many of you as we can. And with that, I believe we are ready to begin with our call to worship. Oh, sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord, bless his name. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. But there we go. You could hear me before, though. If you would stand, we're going to do some stretches. It's been a minute since we've sung as a congregation, so just loose, loosen up, loosen up, small arm circles. Big arm circles. God gave us bodies. Let's use them. Yes. <laughs> okay. We're going to start with a classic, and then since I'm the contemporary worship human, I have some contemporatized, sure, versions of some old favorites for us to work with, and maybe you'll enjoy this morning. So uh, we're going to start with I'll Fly Away. Some glad morning when this life is over, I'll fly away to a home on God's celestial shore, I'll fly away, I'll fly away, oh. You sound good this morning. When the shadows of this life have grown, I'll fly away like a bird from prison bars has flown. I'll fly away. Wow, 
well done. Amen. Please pause for water, Todd. Have you ever noticed every hymn writer is naturally a high soprano? <laughs> Doesn't matter their gender, they all write for high soprano. So if you're not a high soprano, I feel you. <laughs> I'm not either. This is a rewrite of a version of Thou Art, Thou, Thou Art My Vision. I'm a contemporary worship person, so I just know the new one. You are my vision. So if you're not into Shakespearean language, this might be your jam. The lyrics were rewritten by my favorite uh, Northern Irish worship band, Rend Collective. And then I worked actually with a, um, the worship leader at the church I previously worked at to make the lyrics more gender inclusive as well. So this song's for everybody. You are my vision, O King of my heart. Nothing else satisfies only you, Lord. You are my best thought by day or by night. So see, if these were the three you were going to request, now you get to pick your other favorites. This is a modernized version of Come Thou Fount, Come Thou King with a bonus chorus. 
after verse 2. It's thrilling. Come thou fount of every blessing, tune my heart to sing thy grace. Streams of mercy never ceasing, call for songs of loudest praise. Teach me some melodious sonnet, sung by flaming tongues above, praise the mount I'm Fixed upon it, mount of thy redeeming love. I was lost in utter darkness till you came and rescued me. I was bound by all my sin when your love came and set me free now my soul can sing a new song now my heart has found a home now your grace is always with me and i'll never be alone come thou found come thou king Oh, to grace, how great a debtor daily I'm constrained to be. Let thy goodness, like a fetter, bind my wandering heart to thee. Prone to Take and seal it, seal it for thy courts above. Here's my heart, Lord. Take and seal it, seal it for thy courts above. You may be seated. Amen. So nice to sing together. Boys and girls, let me see if you have cards with you. Let me see where my kids are. Sometimes it's hard to see you out there with all the grown-up heads in the way. All right. Good morning. How are you guys? Let's see. I'm a, I'm a thumbs up this morning. Anybody else a thumbs up? Good. Okay, I have a question. I want you to imagine you are asleep in your cozy warm bed in the middle of the night and you hear someone holler your name. If you get up and go look for who that was, give me a thumbs up. If you roll back over and go back to sleep, give me a thumbs down. Some thumbs up, some thumbs down. Oh, a thumbs sideways over here. Okay, now let's say you're back asleep. You've gone back to sleep, you're cozy and warm again, and you hear your name called again. Are you going to get up, thumbs up, and go see who's calling you? Or are you going to roll over and go back to sleep, thumbs down? Hmm. Well, today we are going to hear a story about a boy named Samuel. Now, Samuel's mother's name was Hannah, and she wanted a baby so bad, but she couldn't have, ba couldn't have a baby. And she went and she prayed to God, and she wanted a baby, and God finally blessed her with a baby. And as a thank you, Hannah took that baby to the temple, and when he was a boy, he was there to help the priest. So he lived at the temple, and he was asleep one night, and he heard his name called. And when he heard his name called, he didn't roll over and go back to sleep he went and found the priest Eli because he thought, well, who else would be calling me? It's just us here. He ran there, and guess what Eli told him? It wasn't me. 
So he got back in bed, went back to sleep, and God called again, or what, gave it away. He heard a voice again. (laughs) He heard a voice again, and he went to Eli, and he said, what do you need? I didn't call you. Well, after this happened a few times, Eli, because he was thinking, wait a minute, if it's not me, and I'm the only one here, I bet it's God. And so he told Samuel, okay, listen, go back to sleep, and if you hear someone call your name again, I want you to say, speak, Lord, your servant is listening. Kids, can you say that with me? Speak, Lord, your servant is listening. Man, God would not hear you. (laughs) Let's try that again. Speak, Lord, your servant is listening. And so it happened again, and Samuel did what Eli told him, and guess what? God had a really important message for Samuel, and he told him that message, and Samuel grew up to be a very important figure in Israel's history, and we'll talk about that another time. But I want to know what you, how you think Samuel felt being talked to by God hearing God's voice. How do you think he felt about that? Maybe I see a yellow card out there. I might be a little nervous too, like, wait a minute, God's talking to me. Some of you are saying you would be excited about God talking to you. Now, are you surprised that God could use a little boy who's probably 10 or 11 years old? Does that surprise you? Thumbs up if it surprises you. Thumbs down if it doesn't. Kind of surprises some of you. Now, Do you think God can still use little children today? Thumbs up if you think yes. Grown-ups, do you think that God can still use little children today? Thumbs up if you say yes. We believe that God can use anybody, and we, grown-ups, are excited to see how God is going to use each one of you in your lives as you continue to grow. Let's have a prayer. Dear God, we thank you that you called Samuel, and we thank you that Eli was able to help Samuel know what to do when you called. We pray a blessing on each of these children as they listen for your voice. Maybe not you speaking to them directly, but the ways that you speak to us in ways that are a little more sneaky sometimes. And we pray that the grown-ups here in this room and in their lives might be able to point them to you and help them to know what to do when you call. I ask a blessing on each of these children, and we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Sounds like we had a little bit of a spoiler alert on the uh, reading today. Um, And if you needed a little bigger spoiler, Samuel obviously grows up to be pretty important because the book's named after Samuel. Um, So our reading today is out of 1 Samuel. 3, 1 through 11, and this is Samuel's calling and prophetic activity. Now the boy Samuel was ministering to the Lord under Eli. The word of the Lord was rare in those days. Visions were not widespread. At that time, Eli, whose eyesight had begun to grow dim so that he could not see, was lying down in his room. The The lamp of God had not yet gone out, and Samuel was lying down in the temple of the Lord where the ark of God was. Then the Lord called, Samuel, Samuel. And he said, here I am. And ran to Eli and said, here I am, for you called me. But he said, I did not call you. Lie down again. So he went and lay down. The Lord again called, Samuel. Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, here I am, for you called me. But he said, I did not call you, my son. Lie down again. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord, and the word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. The Lord called Samuel again a third time, and he got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. Then Eli perceived that the Lord was calling the boy. Therefore Eli said to Samuel, Go, lie down, and if he calls you, you shall say, Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. Now the Lord came and stood there, calling as before, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel said, Speak, for your servant is listening. Then the Lord said to Samuel, See, I am about to do something in Israel that will make both ears of anyone who hears of it tingle. 
May you be blessed by the word of God. All right. What songs would you like to sing? Oh, Jane is ready. 562. And I had, and say it again. Number four. Okay, we'll do those two. Let's see what they are. I'm excited. Yes, and then number four. Okay, let's do one and three of 562. Number four, we'll do the first and last verse.
Please pray with me. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O God. Amen. Don't make me ask you again. How many parents or teachers or people with babysitting experience have uttered these words? Or maybe, I shouldn't have to tell you more than once. Anyone who has worked with children knows. Okay, let's be honest, we adults often need a lot of reminders too. It's sometimes important to repeat yourself and repeat yourself and repeat yourself to get your point across. And that is what God is doing in our story for today with Samuel. Divine patience is on full display as God calls to Samuel and calls to Samuel and calls to Samuel. Each time, Samuel misunderstands. He makes the logical assumption that the call is coming from the only other person nearby. And to Samuel's credit, he is attentive to the needs of his aging mentor, turning up at Eli's bedside each time, prepared to assist. But Eli is not calling him. Now, if anyone should be able to recognize the voice of God, it's a priest, right? But it takes a few times before Eli realizes what is happening. Perhaps it doesn't occur to Eli sooner because no one has their wits fully about them when awakened in the middle of the night. Or perhaps it doesn't occur to Eli any sooner because, as the author alerts us to at the start of the chapter, the word of the Lord was rare in those days. But Eli gets it figured out and instructs Samuel on what to do should he hear his name again. Now, I always find it interesting that Eli sends this child back in there by himself. Eli is a priest and suspects that God is trying to communicate to Samuel just in the next room. And he doesn't want to accompany him and see if he too might have an audience with God. Not to mention it seems like a pretty big responsibility for Samuel to just head back in there and have a conversation with the creator of the world. He may have wished for a little mentor support. In any event, Samuel does as Eli instructs him and finally answers God's call. Speak, Lord, your servant is listening. God has some important information for Samuel, information that will make both ears of anyone who hears it tingle. This information, though, is not good news for his mentor, Eli. Previously in 1 Samuel, we learn about the transgressions of Eli's sons, Hophni and Phinehas. When the Israelites would come to Shiloh to make sacrifices to God, Eli's boys would intercept meat that they were not entitled to. Our scripture for today cut off before we heard the content of that ear-tingling news. But if we had continued reading, we would see that God tells the boy that he is about to punish Eli and his household. Eli is included in this punishment because he failed to restrain his sons. A little bit of a terrifying lesson there for parents. The text reports that after his conversation with God, Samuel lay there until morning. Can you imagine what that night must have been like for him? Knowing that Eli would ask him in the morning about what God had told him, and knowing what God's message meant for Eli and his family, We have all had the experience of laying awake in bed all night, dreading something challenging we have to do the next day. That is a lot on the shoulders of a child. The next morning, sure enough, Eli presses Samuel to tell him what happens, but it sounds like Eli was expecting that the news would be bad for him. After all, a man of God had alerted Eli of impending judgment in the previous chapter, And Samuel's recounting of God's message confirmed that indeed punishment was coming. And in fact, it did. In the next chapter, 
The Ark of the Covenant is lost in battle to the Philistines. Both of Eli's sons are killed in battle. And when Eli hears news of Israel's incalculable losses, he falls out of his chair, breaks his neck, and dies. Now, this is a favorite story for children's Sunday school. Do any of you remember learning about it in Sunday school? Has anybody here taught it in Sunday school? Has anybody here ever gone past the part where God calls Samuel? No, we kind of stop there, and maybe today we see why. We usually leave out the rest of the story, because in reality, that important message God has for Samuel is incredibly grim for Israel. Even so, there are some lessons from this nighttime visit from God to Samuel that we can think about related to our own context and situation. First, children need mentors in the faith. Notice that each and every time he hears a call, Samuel goes to Eli. Every child needs an Eli they can go to when life or their experience isn't making sense to them. Someone they can say, okay, this is what I'm hearing or experiencing. Can you help me figure out what it means? Now, we adults may not feel like we are equipped to be mentors to kids with big questions, to kids who face pressures and challenges we never dreamed of at their age. We might be afraid that we don't have all the answers or that we don't have the right answers. But notice that Eli didn't either, at least not at first. What matters is that each time Eli receives Samuel, which communicates to Samuel that Eli is a safe place to go back to as many times as he needs. And ultimately, Eli is able to help guide Samuel on what to do next because of that relationship that they shared. Second, this story shows us that God may say something to the next generation that doesn't feel like particularly good news for previous generations. It is hard to see former things pass away, former things that have been so valuable and life-giving for us. It is hard to trust that what is yet to come might also be valuable and life-giving. Change is hard. This story is often referred to as the calling of Samuel. Samuel grows to be a key prophet and judge for Israel. He is the one who warns the people that they don't really want a king, despite their desire to be like all the other nations. He is the one who warns the people that they aren't supposed to be like other nations because Yahweh is their king. And he is the one who anoints King Saul as the first king of Israel when the people go against his advice. Later, he also anoints David, a man after God's own heart. Samuel will grow to be a leader with successes and failures of his own. But here... At Samuel's beginning, God's call to him signals a critical pivot in the life of Israel. And how much it may grieve Eli to hear it. You'll note that Eli accepts it, even welcomes it. His final statement on the matter, It is the Lord. Let him do what seems good to him. The call of Samuel and the mentorship of Eli put on full display the reciprocity between young and old. The young need the wisdom and experience of their elders to shape and guide them, to help them make sense of their lives and their developing faith. And in doing so, we are challenged to journey with them, embracing that what God is doing in the lives of a younger generation may look different than what God once called us to. Regardless, it is still God doing the calling. Regardless, our callings are all in service to the same kingdom. 
Generation after generation, we are all following the same God. All those pictures in the history hallway represent seasons of God's work in the world, each one different from the previous one and different from the next. And it has been the willingness to embrace the reciprocity between the generations that has allowed us to inherit the faith that we share today. Friends, in the coming weeks, we will need to put out a call for all hands on deck to relaunch our children and youth Sunday school. Also, we will soon begin our next confirmation class, which will mean that we will need elders to serve as mentors. These things will not just happen without a whole fleet of Eli's. Please, Begin praying now about whether you have gifts you can give to these efforts. Ask God if he is calling you to be an Eli to our kids as they grow in their faith. This story shows how much we all need each other in order to be who we are called to be. We truly are on this journey together, young and old, longtime members and new members, Eli's and Samuel's. May we all have the humility, courage, and grace to be open to God's persistent leading. Thanks be to God. Amen. All right, we'll take a couple more hymn requests. 677? Kathy? Two, okay. Let's look at 677. Okay, let's do six, seven, seven. Let's do hymn number two, the first and last verse.
As we turn our attention now to prayer, I'd like to encourage you to take a look at the list of joys and concerns that are printed on your order of worship. And I'd like to draw a few to your attention this morning. We want to be in prayer for uh, Marvin Dernal and Gretchen Byers, who are both recovering from surgery they had this past week. And I also have an update on Matt Cameron, who uh, is a friend of uh, Greg and Margaret Eberhardt's, has been on our prayer list for some time. Uh, he is a young man in his 40s who had a severe case of COVID um, and received a lung transplant overnight. Well, we pray for his family as their road is still long ahead of them, um, but I wanted to give you that important update. I know that you've brought with you this morning joys and concerns that you'd like to bring before God, and I invite you to do that now as we join together our hearts and our minds in prayer. Dear God, we give you thanks for this day of being able to gather together here for worship, of being able to lift our voices and sing together, of being able to offer our praise as a church, all joined here singing as one. We thank you for the gift of music, the gift of song, and the ways that it helps us communicate our love for you. We give you thanks for the many blessings in our lives, ones that we can see with clarity, but also those that go overlooked. We know that we miss so much, but we ask that you give us eyes to see where you are at work, where your mercies abound. We lift up to you this morning those who, for whatever reason, cannot be here among us. We pray that you be with them wherever they are and whatever they're facing. We lift up to you those who are recovering from surgery. We thank you for the healing they've already experienced and we ask that you might continue to tend to them as the great physician. God, each of us comes here today with things that weigh us down, with worries, with griefs, with trauma. Thank you that we can bring these things to you. Hear our prayers, hear the cry of our hearts. You've told us that it's okay if we don't know how to pray that you can hear the Holy Spirit interceding on our behalf with sighs too deep for words. So hear our sighs this morning, but hear us also now as we pray together the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Jerry, was that 480? All right, and anybody, oh, and right here. Say it again. 550, okay, I lost my pencil somewhere. All right, so let's do first and last verse of 480 and you don't have to remember it I'll tell you then the second one so we're ready
I invite you. Whoa. So we don't want to have the microphone in the mask. <laughs> At a more reasonable decibel. Uh, why don't we all stand for our last hymn, and we'll take the light of Christ out as we go. Hymn number 550, we'll, 550, 550, we'll sing the first and last verses. May you go from this place, continuing to sing as you go, knowing that God is with you wherever you might be. In the name of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, go in peace. Amen.